Um, are, we have a couple things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, Mike, are we good? You're good. We're good. Uh, a couple things that we'll be talking about today. One is the introduction of the uh, and overview of the governor's proposed budget, which was uh, presented on January 10th. And the other, the really last three quarters of the presentation is on the actual COD budget, current budget, and then also the governor's uh, proposed budget and how that impacts uh, our budget coming forward. What we do know, oh, these are my famous quotes. I always have quotes in my presentations if you've uh, been here before. So this one is from Joe Biden. Uh, Don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. So I think that goes a long way to talk about our budget and what we value. We know that we provide education to students and we do that through service and we do the service through our teaching staff and our faculty, um, classified uh, administration. So it is a, a very relevant <coughs> quote, I think, at this point. And this is my constant quote that I always have because it always holds true. The budget information we hear today is likely to change tomorrow. So you will see that each and every time I'm doing a presentation. So here are the impacts or the proposed budget highlights that were introduced. Um, this year the governor's budget assumes a modest growth. A little bit disappointing when we attended the budget workshop last week in Sacramento that the revenue projections have been reduced from 4.5% to 2.6%. Um, when that occurs, we have to take a step back and look at why. Uh, what's going on with our current budget? Are revenues less or greater? We, when you read in the news, you hear that the revenue projections for 1560 are above projections. So it's a little bit of a convoluted message. So we, we look to uh, understand why this governor continues to do this. We know that the uh, legislative analyst office often has a more robust projection for revenues. Uh, this governor likes to come in low and end higher, which makes him a hero. We all like to be heroes in, in the revenue world. Uh, the current year, our revenues, as I mentioned, uh, revenues for California are up by 2.5 billion. Now that has a direct impact on Prop 98, and we'll talk a little bit about that later and what it means to educational institutions throughout California. Uh, the governor did warn, he said the R word, uh, and that was uh, a little bit um, of a concern to most of us. R word is recession, D word is depression. Um, we know that we're just, we feel in education that we're just coming out of the recession. We are just starting to grow again, and now there are concerns of a downturn. Um, he didn't say when. He just said, let's be prepared. Uh, and that has been true. If you know, remember, Prop 2 uh, was the Rainy Day Stabilization Fund. And he has held that message. He has done wonderful things for our budget in California. So I think this is a continue, continuation of that message. Um, the increase, he's increasing the rainy day fund or proposing to do so larger than the requirement, which was interesting. I look for that to be the first target of the groups that are uh, meeting up in California right now in the budget committees to try and bring that down to the actual statutory requirement that was passed in the bill. Anyone been watching the stock market? It's been a crazy, uh, crazy, crazy ride. For, it's the worst opening in, I think, history uh, in the first quarter, first month. So a uh, stock market has huge implications to the California budget. Uh, a couple are identified down here below. We know that two thirds of our California general fund revenues come from the personal income tax. Two thirds, that's huge. So as the economy grows, we know as things are better, we assume people pay more taxes. What gets more interesting is the top 1% of taxpayers account for one half of the personal income tax. So those folks that are living up there in the Silicon Valley pay one half of the personal income tax. And most of that, by the way, is from capital gains. Uh, so when there are tax implications, the market is up, uh, depending on where they are, if they want to sell and reap their benefits, uh, we expect those increases to be larger. When markets are down, uh, then losses occur and the taxes will not be as high. So that'll be interesting to see how the rest of this year pans out for the stock market. I personally have a bet with Dr. Kenneman that the market will stay strong. Uh, I think that the market, the Dow, will stay over 15,000 uh, before the, by the first quarter. That's, that's our bet. He believes it's going to go under. So we'll see how that goes. 
Um, governor's budget assumes that 10% of general fund revenues are from capital gains. I think I touched on that a little bit. So that has huge implications for, for us in education. So here's what we know about community colleges. When we look at our budget proposals of uh, the increases, it looks pretty robust. Um, I'm, I was really pleased to see if you compare it to last year in the, at the January proposed budget, it's pretty similar to what we, we saw. And we know that we did receive tremendous amounts of money last year. The one thing that I do caution, these are all targeted monies, targeted areas, which means semi-restrictions. So what we do know is when the economy is good and money comes to California uh, educational institutions, they tend to be focused on what they want us to spend it on. When the budget gets worse and there's reductions, they tend to say, oh, local control. Uh, we'll, we'll let you figure out the tough way to spend your money as it diminishes. So we have a lot of work to do to continue the governor's message, which has been over the last three years, of local control. You know how to spend your money best. We're going to leave it up to you. This tells us that uh, he has, is uh, moving slightly backwards in an area and really targeting. The majority of these monies, by the way, would come in the restricted categories. So that's a, that's a huge impact to our, our budget here at College of the Desert. So thoughts? Um, the budget continues to reflect stability and growth. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, but the growth, the governor takes a lot of credit for the, these increases to education. And I'll tell you that the increases have not really been that impactful at the state budget because the budget for, for educational institution is made up of two components, one being property taxes, the other being state aid. It's an inverse relationship. So it's one calculation. At the end of the day, the calculation is you get this amount of money. As property taxes go up, the state aid goes down. So uh, although he takes credit, and the legislature take credit for increasing uh, monies to our colleges and, and uh, K-12 institutions, much of that has come over the natural with our property tax growth. Uh, Proposition 98, I mentioned that earlier. Proposition 98 is a test. Uh, it was a, a obviously proposition passed by the, the people of California. And it dedicates approximately 40% of the general fund revenues to education. It was a huge win for uh, educational institutions in California. Uh, when the budget is better, that the calculation is done and there's a test that's either test one, test two, test three. We are in test three. If you want to look that up, be my guest. It's quite a co uh, complicated formula. Uh, test three is a good place to be. It, 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 uh, it equates for growth. Um, but what happens when the governor budgets low, he comes in with that low estimate, and we actually end higher, there's some one-time money that comes to us, as opposed to having it in the current budget year. So that has been a kind of a, a theme that this governor has used uh, for the last several years. Last year, if you remember, I think our college received about four and a half million dollars of true-up money, uh, one-time money, resulting from these Prop 98 calculations. Um, a word of caution, when we look back in history, economic expansion, uh, seven years is a long time. But I go back being, again, positive, and I go back to when uh, President Clinton was in office and we had expansion, I think, that uh, it included approximately a 10-year span um, over the time when he came into office and then left, and then, of course, that's when we, we know it's cyclical. That's what we know. So seven years, we're getting a little concerned that this expansion at some point is going to pull back, and I think that is reflected in the governor's reduction in his revenues for the proposed budget here. Uh, one of the things that the elephant in the room, nobody likes to continue to talk about, is Prop 30. We remember, in, what do we rem remember? The people of California passing Prop 30 for sales tax and income tax adjustments. It was that big influx of money that we needed in 11-12. Those are now, it seemed like it would last forever. They are now coming to an end. December 16 is the first phase out. And the income tax, that's a sales tax. The income tax will expire two years after that, June of 18, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, we talked a little bit about Prop 2, the rainy day stabilization. Um, I anticipate big movement in this area. He right now is, is recommending that he overfund that stabilization fund, which really is gearing up again for that R word. Uh, very cautiously, but that also gives him a lot of room to negotiate with his 
the legislature uh, for pushes in different areas of this budget. So uh, I went through the archives. My question is, you know, how much does Prop 30, how much did it really mean to us? So we were able to dig up this uh, on the COU website. Um, there was apparently a news depot that was published for many years. Uh, this happens to be from that uh, archive, and it shows the impact to the COD budget estimated at that time. Uh, so we see that in 11-12, 2.8 million. Uh, in this budget year, uh, it's projected to be 6.4 million. So imagine our budget today being $6.4 million lighter because of the impacts of Prop 30. Uh, you'll see that is the highest year uh, in that 15-16 because that sales tax then uh, starts to, to wander. It's half, half a year only in the 16-17 budget year. So although no one is really talking about it, there are you know concerns in Sacramento and everyone thinks, gosh, we're going to have a new proposition that's going to come and save the day. But I'll tell you, I'm very concerned because we have uh, we've got this extended growth period, seven years, and now we have some additional uh, ramifications and implications from Prop 30 that we'll be facing this, this governor and this legislature. So budget cycle, we're just gonna, this is meaning that it just never stops. Uh, it, you don't pick a part anywhere in there, and we're either talking about this year or planning for next year, which is really what we should be doing. We should be looking to the future, but also learning from the past. So we are currently, um, in the, the blue section, which is the governor's proposed budget. Um, the next information coming to us will be from the governor. Uh, we'll hear all kinds of stuff in the paper about, oh, this group is lobbying for this, this group is lobbying for that. But the next thing that the governor will announce is actually the May Revise, which will be in mid-May. And we will certainly update you. And that information is the information we will use to adopt our budget in June. So here's our calendar. Um, we have a very robust budget subcommittee that we, as you see, meet often. Um, we will be looking at our first base budget productions in March. So we are, uh, at the present time, going through the numbers, uh, doing revenue projections, impacts to our college, uh, and then we'll be meeting with our budget subcommittee groups and uh, updating our information and making recommendations. And if you want to know who your constituent groups are to contact, if you're interested, there you go. Uh, we currently have two vacancies. Uh, uh, the dean used to be Dr. Burr, and he has uh, is in New York. I think yesterday was his first day of work. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a vacant uh, vice president position at, at, uh, on the budget subcommittee. So here are the assumptions. So we're going to now kind of transition into the COD budget and what's happened over the past years and what we base our assumptions off of. We always use the governor's budget assumptions. Um, we typically will go to a, a website called School Services of California, and dartboard information, all those projections are available there, and we will use those when we go forward to project our, our budget. One of the most disappointing things I think that we learned recently is the statutory COLA was decreased. We had 1.6 mil, or excuse me, 1.6 million, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, we had a 1.6% COLA projected, which is what we based our, our future year, multi-year projections on, and that was recently revised down to 0.47. Uh, that's a significant impact to our college, about $500,000 ongoing per year, reduced revenues. So why did that happen? That happened due to oil prices, the stock market, um, global implications, what's going on out there. Uh, that is, by the way, a federal computation. Uh, it's not something that we do, uh, but it is something we use because as that COLA goes, that really tells you how the economy is projected to grow. We know that uh, currently this governor is projecting a 2% growth factor uh, for California Community College's uh, students. That does not mean that 2% is as it used to, that it was uh, stipulated for all colleges. It actually now is a computation and because of the new federal funding formula, or not federal, excuse me, state funding formula for growth, um, our college was the second highest in the state, and so we expect our current growth formula slightly over 8%. We expect that growth formula to be similar. So eligible growth, uh, approximately 8%. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what happened to our growth this year, and we're bringing down that projection. 
but we have the ability to grow. The funding would be there if we're able to grow. We just have to uh, locate the students and get them enrolled. Uh, here you talk about the lottery. Lottery's gone up a little bit. Um, I think with the, you know, what was it, 30, $1.5 billion of, uh, of was just given away in, in one of the um, uh, contests. So I, I think that always goes to that, that chance of, gosh, it might be me. So certainly sales increase. So we can see that has had some impact. Um, we always continue to project a 1.5% revenue shortfall. And that is uh, California-wide community colleges use that factor because there is no guarantee of our revenues uh, with that computation of apportionment. So if state revenues are less, uh, we've got to have something to fall back on. Uh, K-12 have a guarantee, so they don't have this particular. They end up getting a deficit. But in community colleges, we have a, a, de a factor that uh, we always put 1.5 in there. Typically, it will grow um, to the, the revenues or will grow enough to cover the deficit, so it will diminish over time, but it is a factor included in the apportionment calculations. Uh, one of the most concerning things I think that we've talked about the last several years are these two PERS and STRS uh, rates. So we know that uh, back, back in the good days, it was 8.25% for STRS and 11.442% for PERS. These are rates that are expenses to the college for all of us employed uh, for our retirement calculations. So we know that we have deductions out of our check and then there are the employer match or in increased uh, expenses or percentages in its case. We know those actuarial studies are have grown, so the liability is, is larger than it is funded and because of that, that's why you see these increases. The expectation is both of these rates by the year 2020 will be around 20%. So it's a, a significant factor. Um, I think last year we increased the STRS rate alone was a $250,000 impact to the college uh, just from that rate increase. So something that will be built into our model for multi-year projections, but we know as we build that model and those rates go up, that means less of those revenues, new revenues that are coming in are available because the commitment must go here first. Uh, I might add on that too, that, that what happens is, is that we do the projections, it's looking like 300 to 350,000, even more a year additional to our budget. So it's not just, it jumps up, each year it's jumping up and it's stacking up on top. So literally the stirs and purse rates are more than doubling by the time they stabilize out and, and those are all ongoing costs so it was 350 this thousand or 250 thousand this year 350 thousand next year probably um so looking at it from two years ago now all of a sudden we're at 600 thousand above where we were and it just keeps ratcheting up so it, it is a huge impact to the the out years and we spend millions of dollars by the way uh the total comp the total compensation cost when you take that percentage, it's we're talking about that these are just increases to that year over year. The actual commitment is, uh, I think it's well over $3 million for both of the, the two rates. Okay, when we're going to talk a little bit about our combined fund, then I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to get into the meat of the, the funds. Combined fund includes both our unrestricted and restricted funds. So unrestricted are all the things that we have uh, choices to, to make, and restricted are things with strings. So things that they're gonna tell us, you must spend this money on this for this purpose, and you must spend it by when. Those are made up of both federal and state, and sometimes local, but typically the majority is federal and state. When I look at a budget to see the health of an institution or organization, I will go immediately to this line, increase or decrease the fund balance. That tells me, are you staying and spending within your means? So are your revenues aligned to your expenditures? And if we look at that line, we can see, gosh, we look pretty good there. And then there's this big negative there. And then we look pretty good in our current budget here. You want to take a, a deeper look. Why? Why is there such a large impact here? Was it planned? Or were there one-time events that occurred that may mask that? So we know back in 1314, we had two unusual events that occurred. We booked a, a one-time, or we actually debooked a one-time liability that had been booked for the, our FTES issue. 
We had an opinion from the auditor to say, you know, this has been going on too long. It's not, we don't have an amount. It doesn't appear to be due within 90 days, so we're going to release it. So that was a huge thing. Uh, I think it was one point, no. Was it 1.5 million at that point that was booked as a liability? 1.5 million was the book liability. I believe. Yeah, so it's then we had an additional new market tax credit money that came in $1.7 million that came in. Uh, it was a one-time extraordinary revenue piece. We, we, I would love to take credit for it, but we had not much to do with it. It was uh, actually Wade Ellis and the group that was here prior to, during budget uh, crisis, you, you try to look out of the box and think out of the box and go out and find other revenue sources. And this is one that they worked on for a very long time that came to fruition. Uh, and it was $1.7 million of unrestricted funding that came to the college. Uh, so we know that this 831000 although it appears to be uh, make us look very healthy, uh, there are a couple things in there on the revenue side, that $3.5 million from those two events. So if you take that away from there, you'll see that we're not, uh, we're not quite as healthy in that year, which then makes this year make a little more sense. Now, there was another extraordinary event that happened in that year, is that we settled our FTS issue and the state reduced our revenues by 1.1 million. So that is going to occur over the next three years. We're in year two of that. Next year will be the final year. It will be paid off. Uh, thank goodness. So that's how I would be looking at a budget. Obviously, you also want to look at your ending fund balance. Um, obviously, the, uh, what happens here is going to impact that. So you can see we have a dip. Um, pleased to see this, but there's more to the story there. So I'm going to now turn this over to John, and he's going to take you through Fund 11. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're looking at the health of a district, we definitely want to be looking at our unrestricted general fund, and that's generally true because most everything that's in the restricted fund is, is very dedicated for specific things and doesn't have to deal with the day in and day out, or day out operations. So, um, you know, when, when uh, people are evaluating the district, that's where they go. Our Fund 12 has changed a fair amount recently because with the addition of all the student success money, I think there's about $2 million in there in the various programs. Um, there's a lot of these new programs that are going in there that are impacting the operations of the budget, and that's probably, you know, especially with counseling and things like that. And that will even begin to affect our fund because um, uh, that hasn't been the, um, true in the past. And then uh, we've also, we actually are getting a uh, Cal Grant um, supplement for students that's running through our Fund 12, and that's never happened before. So the face of Fund 12 is looking a little bit different, but Fund 11, which is, um, again, this is our core operations, it's what we do, that's the one that we pay a lot of attention to because that truly is the help of the district. Now, again, we want to go back to that increase and decrease of fund balance because even though our budget is big and it's very complex, it's very relatable to a household budget. You want to be able to live within your means, and that means um, your expenses generally less than your income. Now, there's things that are uh, that are um, tied to that, that that are exceptions. And if you look at our um, our annual balance and our or we call it our reserves, that's also like our savings account or a household savings account. So if you're making more than you're earning at the end of the year, you have more in your savings account. Same for us. If you're spending more than you're earning, you have less in your savings account, or you better hope that you have that money in your savings account. And there are things that come in as one-time events um, that affect that, and you've got to be careful about how you plan. You know, if Aunt Bess passed away and left you some money, you can't assume that Aunt Bess is going to pass away every year after that, and so you don't want to go and buy an expensive car that ratchets up car payments that you're going to be obligated towards in those out years when, um, that was just a one-time infusion of money. So as we look at this, um, that's where it's real important to, to look at here to say, are we living within our means? Um, and as we look at this, we have our revenues, expenses, but then there's other um, uh, transfers and contributions. Those are things that get transferred out. Uh, those can be support for other programs, um, other types of transfers. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, again, we have this, this positive uh, here, and again, that, that was influenced by some one-time events. Last year, we did do a significant spend down uh, of $1.8 million. We still held a, a healthy reserve. Now this year, we're looking at a 1.3 increase to our um, ending fund balance, and that looks real strong. The one concern that we have about that is that also has in it a $4.5 million um, worth of mandate cost money reimbursement that's a one-time influx. So if you look at it, 
from that perspective, um, we're actually upside down by about three and a half million as an ongoing basis. And so we want to look at that and be very careful about how we're adjusting things. I want to comment too on uh, we talk about deficit spending is it always a bad thing no it isn't last year we actually targeted uh, there was concerns from a budget subcommittee brought up and, and bargaining groups that our ending fund balances were too high and we agreed so we implemented a, a negotiated four and a half percent off schedule payment for all employees that obviously caused an expenditure to go up in one year and which is uh, part of the, partly the reason you'd see that $1.8 million uh, deficit. So there are times when deficit spending is okay as long as you're, you're spending one-time dollars on one-time things. We look at that $1.3 million and I think, gosh, we're in really good shape. $1.3 million, uh, we're building our ending fund balance. But when you look further into it, you know, we remember that $4.5 million of our revenues was one-time money from the Prop 98 uh, mandate claim. So we anticipate that being a, a theme this next year in next year's budget, a lot of one-time money. Right now, they're targeting, I mean, we were devastated to hear because last year we received over $500 per FTES. This year in the governor's proposed budget, the number is around $65. So that was not uh, what we were hoping to hear. But again, remember, this governor likes to project low and come in high, so we believe that that will change over time. But still, a little bit of concern that it is some one-time money. So. And, and also, please note that you know that we definitely are seeing our revenues rising that we're anticipating. But you also see our costs going along with it as we're restoring programs and things that were, were lost during the, the really tough times. Um, this is a slide that basically shows some of the ongoing commitments and one time so that kind of breaks it down a little bit. Um, how the growth increases. We had a base allocation increase this year that never happens, and, and that was a nice thing to see, and we'd love to see more of that. I know the Chancellor's Office is championing that, but right now it's not in the budget. Um, and then COLA plus the, uh, um, that's our enhanced non-credit program uh, rate, went up to uh, the same rate as credit. Uh, there's, here's the $4.5 million of mandate money, you can see one time. And then also, we received $450,000 this year to increase the, the, the goal of that 75, 25%, that 75% of the, the, the classes be taught by full-time faculty on a statewide level. That was money to give us progress towards that, so that will pay for approximately five new positions. Um, we also got a nice chunk of deferred maintenance and instructional equipment money, which is kind of nice because it's flexible. We can allocate it as we need it towards either meeting our need for instructional equipment. We bought a lot of new uh, um, computers and laptops for the instructors this year. Uh, we had quite a few that needed to be replaced. Um, and it can also be used for uh, our ongoing maintenance, for, or regular maintenance projects around the, the college. And John, before you move, um, I received a, an email from Dr. Hall uh, requesting information about our FON and what is our FON. Our FON is our full-time ob obligation, faculty obligation number. So we are required by law, by statute, to have 50% or above. Uh, so there's a calculation that is done. Currently, we have 101.6 uh, computationally instructional faculty. Next year, that number is expected to grow to 117. Now that is twofold. Uh, Components are that we grew a lot last year. We actually obtained about 8.9% growth, student growth, FTES growth. And the, the governor then is also dedicating money towards increasing that 75-25. So more full-time faculty is, is part of his plan. He's putting money where his mouth is. He's saying, okay, we want you to try to get there. At the same point in time, though, then that impacts our ability to spend our budget. So on our unrestricted side, you can imagine going from 101 or 102 full-time faculty up to 117. Now what we are looking at is much, we talked about the new monies coming in, they're significant, they're restricted. Well, much of that, over half of our uh, full-time faculty obligation number, the, the 117, the growth will be able to be paid for by restricted money. So we are currently working on that and identifying those positions um, at the end of the day, I believe that we will only have five additional faculty uh, that will hit our unrestricted fund. 
Uh, so when we talk about the full-time faculty, that 450, that is unrestricted, but it's targeted for, so we're gonna track that separately to make sure that we are in compliance or we are doing uh, what the governor wishes us to do. So we will be adding, and there are actually five full-time faculty associated with that. They tell you how many you're supposed to hire and they give you the amount they're gonna give you. And whether that works or not under your salary schedule is up to you. So we will be complying with that. We are also looking at uh, many positions being able to be funded by our student success. Uh, I know Fred over there is very happy that many of the prioritization uh, has, has been identified for uh, counseling positions. So we're, uh, we're happy to have that growth there as well. So all of this will be uh, compiled into our first budget draft, which is, is going to be out in March. Okay, um, I think we covered a lot of uh, this. I, I couldn't let this go. So I had to have it. I had to have it on the number slide as well as in writing, because it it really you can't just look at numbers and make sense of it. It really you, there's a story to tell, and if there are one-time events in that story, we need to tell them, uh, and we can be better for it. Um, we want to be transparent as possible. Uh, we work very hard to do so with our budget subcommittee. And uh, these, unfortunately, I would love to say that these don't happen, but they do. So we need to talk about them and understand them and understand the impacts to our budget. Yeah, and one of the things that we kind of had to bring to the board as bad news this last uh, month is that we built this budget being optimistic because we were granted um, about 8% unconstrained growth rate. And uh, there was a, you know, we wanted to do a shoot for 10% because if we could get out there, we'd probably get funded for it. Um, but as it's working out, we're much more close to the 3% mark. And so to keep our budget aligned and realistic, um, at the last board meeting, we reduced our revenues uh, projections for this year down to that 3% mark. Hopefully we can do a little better than that, but um, uh, it, we, we really believe it's gonna be pretty close to there at this point. So, um, and uh, I, I think we pretty well talked about everything else in there. Now this is the restricted um, uh, fund 12. If you look at this, we're going from 9.5 million up to 18.4. Again, we've had a whole lot of, most of our new money that's come in has come in through student success and learning, the, the new um, Cal Grant supplement that comes in, the adult education block grant is flowing through our budget. We only get about 300 and something thousand of that, but it's two million added into our budget because we're the fiscal agent for the region. Um, and most of it comes into us and then we turn around and pass it out to the various um, school districts and the county office of education to run their programs but we're the we're the administrative part of it so it winds up hitting our budget so there but you can really see the dramatic change um, as far as what's happening there so, okay so this goes back to the quote at the beginning uh, Joe Biden's quote is you know show me your budget and I'll tell you where your priorities are we always like to go back to see how do we fare? Um, are we, wh where are we committing our money? Is it changing? How is it changing? So we go back to 11, 12, uh, and we can see that 86.1% of our total budget, that's both funds, by the way, are committed to staff. So that includes salaries and benefits. Uh, we dipped in 12, 2012-13 to 85.1. Uh, a number of reasons, the expenditures could have grown, restricted monies for equipment could have grown. I mean, we'd have to look into you know what occurred during that period of time. Um, obviously, we know we didn't get any raises, right? We got raises, I think, in 13, 14, the first year, 3%. Uh, and then last year, we had that gross to 86%. We know we had the 4.5% off schedule. Uh, so it's pretty consistent, um, and that's what you'd want to look for as from a trending standpoint. If you find that there is an inconsistency there, we're going to want to look into why and dig into the details. So um, I think that uh, um, says so. One of the things that I think will happen is the 15-16 budget, we know that we don't spend everything we allocate, so I anticipate that 85.7 number to be higher. Uh, because all expenditures won't be expended, and we know if we know algebra, uh, we know that that denominator, if it goes uh, smaller, then it, uh, that part should go up, the percentage. So, uh, fund balance components, big, big subject in budget subcommittee. Um, where, why do we have such a high fund balance, and where is it committed? Um, one thing to look at the number and say, gosh, it's it's really high. 
but it's another thing to look at it, say where are the commitments and, and why. So we look at the 2013-14, uh, 10.2 million ending fund balance, that's an actual number because it's history. 14-15, 8.3 million, remember we had deficit spending, targeted deficit spending because we gave about 4.5% off schedule. And then 15-16, 9.6, so that's the difference of that 1.3 that we talked about. But again, a lot of one-time monies uh, included in there. So how does it all spin out? You know, 7.5% is our board recommended reserve, so that equates to, and that's by the way on the total funds, um, so 7.5% of total expenditure budget is then dedicated into a reserve, and that's a, a targeted by our board of trustees. Uh, and then we have a reserve for growth, one of the, and other, by the way. I, I'm looking at that number this morning, I'm thinking, that number is way too high. Um, because growth at this point, I believe, is about 1 point, I think 1.8 million. So we know that that other, the difference between 1.8 and the 3.1 is just, we're, we're targeting for other things. So what might they be? Uh, it's really just a catch all. Um, so I'm gonna go into, we are currently negotiating. So we, ha we know we have that impact coming. Uh, so there's some money in there that we're, we're looking at, but again, cautionary with the four and a half million, because I think that, that gives us that uh, extra cushion that we think we might have that we need to be concerned about. Uh, and, and certainly the more efficient we are in staffing uh, and the more growth we have, the better our budget picture will be. The new market tax credit money there, that 1.596 million uh, is still sitting there. The amount goes down. We have spent uh, zero of that money as of this point. Uh, we just have a uh, cost of servicing the fund. So at the end of the day, we expect to have about 1.3 million. Is that the projection? I think it's actually a little more than that. Uh, so at, there's a seven year period where we have to pay for fees and things. And at the end of the day, we will um, have that. Now we currently are working with a, there's, it's a two pronged group. Uh, part of our board of trustees is one group. And then there is a board, a financing board that is made up of, uh, uh, members of the City of Indio uh, Council, their city manager, uh, Dr. Kenneman, um, I think uh, Trustee Broughton is on our, uh, and they will determine there's targeted monies because the monies were earned uh, because of the institution, the Indio uh, campus. So that was the new market tax credit. We were eligible because of that area. So we're going to be targeting. Uh, those monies for the for a lot of uh, wonderful things in that area, hopefully child care or some other things that will be uh, wonderful to introduce. So um, then we are uh, proud to say too that we're, uh, we've, the reserve for the enhanced student access, that was a one-time commitment, the temporary teachers and everything that we needed to do to scramble to do to get those staff to increase, and we did achieve that growth, by the way, of 8.96%. So it was a tremendous, tre tremendous effort and successful one because that actually went into our base uh, moving forward. Other one-time designations, uh, we don't have any at this point. So that just goes to show when uh, direction is given that if we do have something, that million dollars, by the way, was targeted initially for the 4.5% um, increase. So that's what was shown this one time. It's just historical, I love graphs, and I like to see what happens over time. So you can see uh, the, the blue area is our unrestricted fund, um, and the percentages. This, this was, by the way, as of our uh, adopted budget. So all the other years are actuals, and the adopted budget is uh, um, the current budget. One of, one of the things I'd like to point out is that uh, um, Notice in this year that, that almost half of it was restricted. Now, um, Lisa and I are both very strong proponents that it should be, the red portion should be as small as possible, simply because restricted programs are dedicated programs and it's money apportioned for the students of that year. So if you have big holdover, you didn't spend those dollars on those students who were, it was targeted at. So that's one of the efforts that we've been looking at doing is trying to reduce the red portion of that. Um, that budget to make sure that that money gets spent and it, and it services the students it was intended for. This is just again another graphic shows you how we spend our money, the percentages. Now this is just the unrestricted graphic. Um, so we, we concentrate on that simply because those are the monies that we have real, more control over than restricted. So that was a, a budget subcommittee when we looked at both uh, total budget or unrestricted we decided to go with 
the unrestricted uh, if we thought it was more relevant. So. And then here, yet another table that shows you the same information, but just uh, some people like color and table uh, graphics and other people like numbers. So we try to get it both ways. Again, you can see the commitment to staff. Now, this is a little different than the graphic or the table shown earlier, because that table was the total budget. Can't lose sight of that. Um, this is just the unrestricted portion. So thoughts and considerations. So our 15-16 budget, we reflect a balanced budget. That 1.3 million shows that we are ha we have a surplus. But again, that four and a half million continues to be a, a subject there. It haunts me. I, I hope that we're wise and we are able to move into our future. Uh, we're as a government institution. Our goal is to spend what we receive. Uh, believe it or not, you take governmental accounting, and then the best governmental accounting we know is when you. Money is earned for our students, it should be spent on those students. So that we believe in that here. Um, our unrestricted balance is projected to increase uh, by the 1.3. The revenues, again, four and a half million one-time money. Negotiations are in progress. So we know that that is still looming this year. So that 1.3 won't be 1.3 at the end of the day. Our FDF's growth has been revised downward from 6% to 3%. That was significant. We. Uh, in the past, I don't think the uh, budget staff uh, changed the budget throughout the year, and we recommend doing it, as I said, it, it, the information I tell you today is going to change tomorrow. That budget needs to reflect what we currently believe. Well, we currently, I currently believe that 3% is a more realistic growth than 6%. So we went ahead and took a budget revision to the board in January, and we revised the budget down by $1.1 $1 .1 million. And on top of that, we looked to see that our adjunct uh, salary projections were low, so we added $500,000 to that expenditure category. So total $1.6 million change in our, our predicted ending fund balance. So that was done, board approved, and now it is a current budget, which is why we have slides that show adopted budget and current budget, because that current budget should reflect what is currently going on. Um, governor's proposed budget includes targeted increases in one-time monies. Um, we will keep our budget subcommittee comprised. <coughs> uh, we have a portal out there. We post information as it becomes relevant. Um, I do anticipate the 16-17 budget to get better at the May revise simply because uh, experience from this governor is he likes to come in low in January and build uh, and be a hero. So, um, and then we have one last slide. Which uh, we thought was the, quite appropriate. The, yeah, you got to go over and start. It's always the, the big anxiety is the, is the uh, video, embedded video going to actually play? Uh -oh. uh, let's try it back again. And I'm not seeing the control. Oh, oh. No. Where is the control? Oh, it was so funny, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to be, you have to have a little sense of humor. Um, anyone? 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 Yes, anyone, exactly. anyone. Yes, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's really what we were going to leave on a light note. <laughs> it is, it's from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and it's just a hysterical thing that talks about, I'm sure we've put you to sleep by now, and they have very, a few students in the room they show that are just uh, not quite even wanting to understand the content. So that's what we wanted to leave you with. And at this point, we are open for questions. So hopefully you have some. Just a question of curiosity. What is our reserve, reserve ratio at this moment? The reserve issue? Reserve ratio. Ratio. Seven and a half percent of total budget expenditures. So if you were to go to our budget and look at the total budgeted expenditures that are allocated and multiply that by seven and a half percent, that is what our reserve is currently. It's about $4.9 million, if I remember correctly. So that is the percent. Now, um, I think in a, it, it, our board policy states 5%, and that is something that's, I believe, community college-wide, but our board target was changed during the budget crisis, and it was increased to 7.5%. Very wise to do so, because it allowed you to have a softer landing when those huge budget cuts occurred, those one time, or not one time, they were supposed to be one time, and they lasted for about five years. So, good question. Laura? Um, so you had said from page nine about unrestricted, um, the, the growth, you were thinking that that was not three million, or did I misunderstand? Page nine. 
Um, I don't have slide numbers on here. Which one is that, John? So, is that slide 18? Is that what you're talking about? I, um, so. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> reserve for growth. So if we if we look at what the growth would be, I think I wrote it in my notes that uh, three percent growth was one point eight million dollars. Okay. So we so so we, this is a good question. Um, do we anticipate growing? Yes, we do. We've already grown. We know that. So in our fall term, we we grew. We know we had some rollover from last year because we decided strategically as a college only to go to the point of restoration for community colleges because anything beyond that restoration, you're not guaranteed. So we thought we are targeted to grow. Uh, in this year, we're eligible to grow. We know we'll be funded if we grow. So we were conservative and said we're going to go to the restoration piece and no more, and we're going to let the rest of those FTES roll over into the current year. So. Um, that the 3% growth, that 1.8 million actually includes that rollover, about 147 FTES. I didn't include it in there because I thought it would get too complicated, uh, but that's a good question. So the difference between the 3.1 and the 1.8 and the 1 .8 is not uh, reserved for growth. So it's, it's other, which we have. And, and this is um, after your, your last revision and board, right? This Correct, slide. yes. So it's um, going back down to 3% Correct. Yes. So is that three percent uh, to achieve that three percent? Are you estimating reaching into summer of two thousand sixteen for some FTS? And so how many? Uh, we currently. Uh, good question. And we yes, the answer is yes. We do anticipate uh, reaching into the next summer, 16, 17 summer, no more than we did. I mean, that's a strategic question. Our projections were based on, uh, I, I think, approximately 150. Uh, but it will all depend on what happens in spring, the spring term. So we've all been watching our fill rates. Um, we've met uh, many classes have been canceled. We're, so those projections are currently being revised. But uh, that's a great question. Then we have to determine. Uh, we still don't have our growth rates for 16, 17, so we may decide to take it all in 15, 16. I mean, those are all strategic questions that we'll be talking about at the subcommittee. Yeah, so. I think we have to be careful about, uh, well, not careful, but I think it's important. I don't know if I would call it growth if we're, if we're pulling 375 FTS from summer of 15 and 150 FTS from summer of 16. So it's pretty unusual for us to have to pull FTS from both summers um, and, and then call that growth. Well, there has been no growth funding. So it's a, a new, I mean, since 2011, nine, I can't remember, I think eight, nine. So it is strategically you want to do, because you have to worry about maintaining as well. So I, I agree. Our, our goal would be if we could reach our target in the current using primary terms, that would be our goal. Um, we know we have already some coming over from last year, from summer, because we chose not to use it because that funding wasn't certain that it was there. So these are all great, great questions that we'll be while we're on this slide here, so you have the new market tax revenue, and you mentioned that the, we haven't spent any money, but the balance is going down just for administering the fund. So that's $111,000 worth of fees associated with that fund. What did we get for that $111,000, and who did well, it go to? Yeah, one of the things that wasn't reflected in there is that board did authorize, authorize the transfer, and I can't remember, um, it, um, but there was a dollar amount transferred to um, three agencies, I believe, in Indio. Correct. Um, so there was a three. There were proposals that were received by this financing board, and three grants totaling three hundred about three hundred forty thousand dollars. Is that correct? So I, I don't. I know we didn't transfer that much. So I'm not. I don't. I, so I don't we remember. received, and it was actually uh, that was part of the this new market tax credit. Um, was the you had to have community input and support. So there was uh, grants that were written and reviewed by this financing board, and then there were grants awarded. And they were awarded to three agencies in India. One of them was the museum, 
Uh, one of them was the... Is there, is there something with early childhood? Early childhood. So so just to be clear, the, the, the $111,000 decrease in the current budget is not is not fees going to a financial advisor somewhere out there. It's yeah, actually, some of the, some wait, of wait the, I didn't let me finish my question. Right. So it's not so it's not fees being paid to a financial advisor. It's actually money that we're providing to our community to assist them. I that believe that the, the money was provided in the 14, 15 year. And I do, I do believe these are fees. So this transaction, by the way, was a much larger transaction. It was approximately $10 million. Yeah. So this $10 million transaction comes through um, institutions and it goes from this to this to this. And that whole time over seven years, there's this process that occurs and the fees that have to be paid. We are not a con in control of that. We are a beneficiary. We happen to have an uh, institution at a time. Yeah. It, it's, uh, we are to the good. Are the fees horrendous? Yes, they are. Uh, but we still, at the end of the day, benefit what we buy. We have to do an annual audit and that kind of stuff. Right. So, so you mentioned our fund. But does somebody else know what it is? Yeah, we'll go ahead, Kelly. You go, you go ahead. I'll report it. So um, the FOMS, so going to 117 and we're at 101.6 right now. So do you know, and you may not know this, but do you know what our number is of full-time um, faculty on the ground at this moment? Do you have any other Well, I know what the calculation states for the calculation, but the full-time faculty, when you talk about uh, classification full-time faculty versus what the calculation is. The calculation only includes instructional, so it's it's a different. Well, uh, actually, no, actually, the FON, first of all, the FON doesn't include the uh, temporary. Correct. But it does Correct. include all the tenure track faculty. Yes. So it including, including counselors. Including yes. counselors yes. and, and yes. librarians and that sort of thing. So and then it's also increased from an, an IAs, I think, right? Is the FON includes an instructional assistant or? Um, yeah. Okay. There's a calculation, so it's not just when you extract the information from HR, you have to go through and actually uh, compute it. So the computational, I mean, I can't say body for body, the computation is the 1.1, 101. The 101, I got it. Um, and so we're at right now, so we're supposed to be making progress to, like the rest of the state towards the 75% goal, uh, like the rest of the colleges in the state. And we're at, uh, you mentioned 50%, but I think it's about 43, 43%. So that's a different calculation. The 50% law is different than I'm not talking about the 50% law. Yeah. I'm talking about that the was law. what I was talking about. Oh, okay. So right now, though, we're at about 43%, right? We're supposed to keep, and they gave us some money to improve that number. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that at this point. No, it is. I looked yeah. it up on the okay. answers. Okay. So I'm going to take your word for it. Okay. So we know that the, the governor has targeted money in this year's budget to use toward that. We did not use that money because we weren't notified of the money until August, and it's a little late to do uh, staffing. So we actually are dedicating that money forward into next year. We show it on our slides, uh, and we're using it to offset the cost of those additional faculty. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Brent. So the reserves, I want to go back there just for a second because I'm just not real clear. Um, if when we look at the ending balance, is that what we're referring to as our reserves? No. And that's a great question because most people do look at it that way. Your ending fund balance is an ending fund balance. So it's whatever's left after you've closed your year or projected if you're looking at budget. Your reserves, there are different types of reserves. There is a board reserve or economic uncertainty reserve, which is by statute required. Um, that is our 7.5%. Our 7.5% is not a statutory, but it is a board recommended. So that is figured off of total expenditures. Where, where is that number in our document? It is the 4.9 million. So this, this, this is this you can look right here, so we have nine million six hundred thousand dollars, and what they're saying is five million of that is set aside for reserve. It's off the table. So go so I'm rounding, right? Go, so, go it's, back. so I'm looking on the current. Yeah. yeah. So go back yeah, because it's, you're it's you're not, the computation is not based off of any fund balance, it's based off of total expenditures. Correct, so but what I'm saying is that this, the fund balance is 9,681, mm -hmm. and they're saying that, that I understand where the computation yeah. came from, right. but uh, the okay. reserve, no, so forward. Oh. forward, one more. So it's this number here? This? No, that's, that's yeah. wrong. Is that, 
It's oh, total yes. expenditures times seven and a half percent. That's where the reserve is, and that's a computation that is used to calculate the economic uncertainty. But, uh, but realistically, I guess the idea is that the, the ending balance is the reserve. Is the total I reserve. don't agree with that because our ending fund balance, let's go back to the components of ending fund balance. Um, there are certain things that are in there that you can't spend, like this new market tax credit. That has strings to it. And you may have a commitment. So let's say we have a legal settlement that we had so with FTS. So if you if you have that legal settlement and you know that you must pay it, you have to show it separately. It cannot be included in that that economic well, reserve. Mm -hmm. Potential liabilities from, from the ending balance, then you would have to it's, it's anything that you that is designated. So right now we only have two things that are designated. Well you have reserve for enhanced students. But we we yeah, but we've zeroed that out. Okay. So that was done in just that one year. So what we do know is that our new market tax credit, if we didn't designate it and put it out there, it would just get in the big black hole, we call it. And, and you want to be able to utilize it for what it was intended. So this group that is a financing uh, board is going to come back to us and say, we're ready to spend our money, we've done our negotiations, we want to have a child care center at this place. And they're going to look for that money, and if we haven't reserved it here, we're going to have to come up with it. So that's why we show it as a component. So, if I, just to try to get clear, because I'm really pretty new to this budget <coughs> stuff, but if if we're saying that the ending fund balance is nine million five hundred thousand something, and I'm saying say. that, what, what, so what what happens? What's going on with that money? It's the ending fund balance. Where is that money? That's the total. So if you take the total and then you reduce the total of this plus this plus this equals that. So it's it's one number, and then of that number, what is it made up of? Is what we're trying to say is it, after the after the at the end of the day, we have total revenues and total expenditures and other outgo, and we have a change to that ending the beginning fund balance that becomes our ending fund balance. And then what is made up of that ending fund balance? So what's in there? So, okay, one last follow-up on this one. Yeah, good questions. Benefit. So the 4.949 um, number that we're saying that we're putting in our reserves, mm -hmm. what, never mind that dollar amount right mm -hmm. there, what's in our reserves today? 4.9 million. And so, so when we, when we add to that, it, 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 it grows, right? That number The, the grows. number will, will each computation is done based off the total expenditures at the time. So it's always 7.5%. Okay? So you're looking at a budget. What, what happens at the end of the year what you talk, where you're talking about a fallout? So that money um, goes into the next year's beginning fund balance, and then whatever's left, you can either... I could have done this a number of ways. I could have said... I only want to show what we're reserving for growth, so the 3% here, and I could have let this fall out to stay available or whatever, but it's just other. So am I, you know, do I want to say that it's, we haven't designated? I certainly know that we have things coming at us that we need to reserve it for, because if, some, if we see something down there, the president comes and says, you know what, I think I'd like to buy uh, new furniture for, you know, all of uh, the child care or all of, uh, and so those numbers become dangerous when we don't designate them. If, if we've settled negotiation and we've done everything that we needed to do, we would show that number is uh, uncommitted for sure. Um, we, we have no, I mean, and I, I think Fred, if you'll talk to your group on budget subcommittee, we really try to be as transparent and and if there is extra money there, we want to know about it, and then we want to uh, spend it with the, the uh, input so from the If I may be short to say, 7.5% 7, 7 is just a, like you said, recommended board, and the rest of it is preserved. It doesn't have to be. It just depends on what your, I mean, in this picture, correct. But there could be a time, so let's say, for example, we no, want to get... This is our situation, right? This is our situation, yeah. So basically, so, whatever the rest is, is just reserve, not called board recommended reserve. But it is reserves, but not called board, board it, it, recommended reserve. It doesn't have to be, because you could say unallocated. If there was no 
but but doesn't matter. I mean, in, in terms of ending fund, mm -hmm. that's what is being reserved. Correct. That's and you're what saying we have that 7.5 percent of it is a board recommended, but then we have a lot more reserved. Correct. Than the Which, board recommended. That's very good. The difference from ending fund balance to that is that's very good. Yes. Can I just make one more comment or question and comment kind of combination? Um, we went through really tough times a number of years ago, and um, if I remember correctly, when we went through those times, the faculty and staff made a lot of concessions to ensure that this the the college would continue in, in, in good stead. Um, at that time, I don't remember uh, the college dipping into the reserves at all to manage that. It was all on the backs of the faculty and staff that work here. And that's all great and good. It just goes to show that people here care about this place and we want to see it to continue. My point is, that being the case, why do we feel the need to raise it from 5% to 7.5% when we're we're worrying about something that hasn't happened. We're worrying about something that historically, the worst case scenario that's ever been in the state, we managed to deal with without ever touching that fund. And now we're saying we need to save more to do nothing with later when we have a problem because the faculty and staff will take the appropriate steps again to ensure that the college continues to roll in. The so, so I'll talk to, a little bit about the board recommended reserve is not something new. The seven and a half percent has been around for, I'm going to say, seven or eight years. Um, I will go back and get you that uh, amount. The statutory amount for community colleges is five uh, for our size institution. So that is not a choice. The board recommended we can get you the history on that. Um, as far as um, on the, the backs of employees, when you go back and you look at the commitment to, you want to make sure you're an ongoing, you, you have an ongoing institution, ongoing concern. And, and when we have lived through the budget crisis, as we have, uh, we know that there were some one-time cuts that were in the middle. This college did an amazing job because they had, and, and as whether they went into the reserve or not, I will bet you, from a cash standpoint, they absolutely did. You only see that reserve at one time, which is during your during that budget year, um, and at the end of the year when it's reported. But I will guarantee you, from a cash standpoint, this college has not had to borrow money, and borrowing money is very expensive. And one of the reasons they didn't have to borrow money is because they had a slightly higher reserve. There are many theories about reserves, and I will tell you that most uh, administrations and uh, uh, groups that are CBO groups want you to have a 10%. So, you know, our institution, for uh, whatever reason, it was changed, it was decided to go from a 5% statutory to the 7.5, but I'm happy to provide that information on when that was done and what was the re what were the reasons behind it. Well, one thing I'd like to point out, just for perspective, is that the amount that we finished up actual, because this is based on budget. We're not going to spend all the budget, so when we end the number, that will probably be a little lower. But if you look at that 4.2 million, that probably wouldn't pay for a high month of uh, payroll. So it's, you know, it, it, in some what means it's a lot of money, and in other ways it's really not because, um, yeah, it's one month's worth of payroll, so. Yes. Um, thank you, um, good presentation. Um, uh, uh, but I think I really like the, for 13, 14, the other one time designation separated off from the growth. So I, I think that would make it clearer okay. um, um, what is really for growth. And, and thank you for answering the question, because you answered it, mm -hmm. but just kind of as a thought for, for future presentations, I think that would be helpful. Well, I, I guess I could have. I struggled with yeah. where to put it. I didn't want to assume that it was one time, because to me, one time is one time. So oh, I see. I didn't want to make that in, in this particular I see, right, year. That was, I see what you mean. Yeah, in this um, particular year, we wanted to tell you that. Right. <laughs> but I don't want to make that assumption now. But I, but I guess at least separate it out, what is actual growth and just other, maybe another other. OK. That's not one. I see. I, Happy to I do that. I missed that the one yeah. time. You're right. Yeah, that would have been in there. So, thank you. OK, thank you all very much. Thanks. Appreciate it.